Hello and welcome to this, the latest uh, of the online events at the King's Fund. Today we're going to be talking specifically about mental health in the long-term plan for the NHS. I'm Alex Bayliss, I work at the policy team here uh, at the King's Fund. We've got well over a thousand people registered to watch this event, uh, so please submit your questions because you set the agenda, you determine what it is we'll discuss about the long-term plan. At the bottom of your screen, there's a box, type your question in there, but please keep them short. Uh, otherwise, if they're too long, we won't be able to get through all of them. We've got an expert panel to answer your questions, uh, and I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves uh, now. So, Hi, I'm Mark Wood. I'm uh, chair of NSUN, which is the National Survivor User Network, and we amplify the voice of uh, user and groups um, with experience of mental distress in England. And you're chair of, of NSUN? Yes. And what, what are NSUN's priorities under your chairmanship? Um, I mean, we're, so, we're currently campaigning around the value of user-led groups um, because we've had quite a diminution of, of, of user-led groups in mental health, not just in mental health actually, across all the disability field. Um, and we, we feel they're very, very valuable and a very effective way of uh, you know, consulting and delivering services. So making the case for users to really have a voice yeah. in services. Yeah. Thank you very much. Our next guest. I'm Rachel Byrne. I'm Exec Director of New, Model, New Models of Care at Home Group. So Home Group is a national housing association. We have about 50 to 55,000 homes across, across England and Scotland. The piece that I look after is our supported housing portfolio. We have around uh, 350 different supported housing schemes across the UK and I am trying very hard with a team to redesign a lot of those services and create new ones that face the challenges of both the NHS and social care, particularly around mental health. And, and your organisation is supporting this event, which we're very grateful for, <laughs> uh, but you've clearly got a particular interest uh, in... Have, in yeah. Would you like to say a little bit about it? We um, have been, well in our history, always run services around mental health for people either for short term or long term. Um, housing need but what we are doing and have been doing over the last two years is to design very bespoke schemes uh, both in how they're designed and developed so they fit better with some of the health pro problems people have but also to meet the need of the NHS so for us we were always dependent on local authorities social care funding and that's great but we also knew that a lot of the acute trusts, you know, were at capacity and beyond and the issue of out of county placements. So we, we decided to approach trusts directly and start to co-design services with them that would mean that people could step down from hospital. And that's my primary function. <laughs> and you, you seem passionate about I it. Uh, thank <laughs> you. And our third uh, member of the panel. Hi, I'm Sophie Collett. I'm Director of External Relations at MIND, the mental health charity. And MIND's got a long history of working directly with people with mental health problems and influencing the policy agenda. Can you say a little bit about your, your role in the policy agenda? Yes, uh, we've, we're interested in a, a range of issues actually around mental health, um, inclu uh, you know, not just within the NHS, but benefits and housing and all sorts of other issues that you know, affect people day to day. As far as the NHS work is concerned, um, our chief executive, Paul Farmer, uh, chaired the task force that led to the five year forward view and he's been involved in the governance of that and likewise um, in some of the uh, later de developments around the, the long term plan now and um, trying to make sure that that really does work and does move us forward for mental health. Um, but also uh, we have local services around the country across England and Wales who are providing some of those services with the NHS or indeed with local authorities. Great, thank you. So for our online audience, uh, you can see we've got three uh, perspectives from the third sector. Uh, so it's a real opportunity to get some uh, voluntary community sector organisations uh, input to thinking uh, as, an, as a supplement to NHS thinking. So, so uh, take advantage of these three different perspectives that we've got here. Get your questions coming in, but I'm going to start the discussion off first. And Sophie, I wonder if I could ask you to start uh, what, what is it in the long-term plan that you think is exciting for mental health? What are the opportunities that you want to see um, followed through to, to fruition? 
Um, that's quite a big question. And uh, I mean, one of, the, one of the things that is exciting is when you think about how far back mental health has fallen. So, you know, between three quarters to two thirds of people don't get any service for mental health. So the majority of people don't get a mental health service and they didn't at the beginning of the five-year forward view and the majority of people will think, oh, the five-year forward view didn't do anything for me. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, it, and it didn't, but it, it has started to make some progress. And the big concern was at the end of the five-year forward view, people would go, oh, mental health, we've done enough of that, let's move on, a and still leaving most people untouched. And, and one of the exciting things is actually, well, no, mental health is still a big priority with there's a commitment that the funding should grow faster for mental health than it will do for the rest of the sector. I have to say only slightly faster mm -hmm. and considering the space we've got to make up that is you know it's parity is not going to be happening anytime soon but we are still moving towards it I think. So so in a sense the commitment in itself is um, is positive and what we need to make sure is that that momentum is gained, that people don't lose hope, that the, the commitment is really followed through and really genuine across the NHS um, so that people are committed actually to improving services, not just improving all these in individual services so that people get a better experience. So, so quite a long way to go. Don't, don't expect it to be the simple solution because we've got a lot of ground to cover. And just to sort of remind some of those commitments that are in the long-term plans are things like £2.3 billion extra, more of a focus on children and young people's mental health, and uh, uh, more capital investment uh, into the services, and some access targets for emergency treatment and uh, yeah. talking therapies and reducing out-of-area placements. Yeah. And I was going to say, and another really important um, shift, which is great to see, is this focus on community um, services in, sort of linked to primary care, so that if you're not in hospital, broadly, there's a focus on that your care should be seamless, in and out of the voluntary sector, in and out of primary care, um, and much more holistic. Hold that thought because those themes of the whole person and not just hospital care are going to come up again throughout the discussion, I think. Can I just turn to Mark and ask you the same question from the other perspective? What are the things that you're most worried about from the long-term plan? What are the challenges, the risks or the things that are missing? I mean, for, for, for our perspective, uh, talking from a sort of user group's uh, perspective, we're, we're I don't see at the moment that how um, the, co the community approach is going to work, focusing as the long-term plan does, specifically on the NHS. There's a yawning gap uh, around other community um, assets, um, public health and social care in, in particular, um, as well as the third sector um, you know, it, it, that isn't there at the moment and there's, there's no real investment uh, as such in, in that. Um, I think I don't, I'd also see at the moment the NHS by its almost definition is a very medically based model of, of provision um, and we don't see much um, as far as the social model goes which is where we come from really from a user perspective um, there's a lot of fine words around placing the person at the center of their care but we don't see much evidence of that uh, where most of the people that we represent are, are being done to rather than um, helping to you know have a have an input into what sort of care never mind a choice uh, choice would be good I think, I think this is a really important theme that it would be really good to get some questions on throughout this session about how do we make sure the long-term plan leads to care that really meets people's needs rather than just the NHS perspective, the whole person's uh, needs and wants. Rachel, uh, we touched on the fact that um, there's much more focus on community mm -hmm. services, not just hospital services uh, in the long-term plan. Uh, what's your take on that as, as a provider in the community? I'd start by saying the piece about community is what, what 
what do we feel is, is meant by that? And for me, community, for most individuals, is about their home and where they live and who they connect with in their area. And so I was disappointed, but I'm trying to see the other side of it, I was disappointed that housing wasn't explicit in any way in, in the uh, long-term plan. However, if we think about housing as being the bedrock of how communities work, then I think it's our role as a provider and one will take to make that voice heard about the role housing can play. So for us, we work directly, directly with a number of mental health trusts, particularly in providing step-down provision. So we are about housing solutions to, I guess, alleviate some of the pressure on the acute wards and also enable people from out of county to come back in. But it is the wider role of how housing can play out in communities around design and not just maybe all the specialist bespoke design that we do, but how we can make sure housing is a player in STPs and in discussions that health have. So that leads nicely into the question I was going to ask, jumping into the questions coming through online. Uh, Casey at NHS Providers has, has asked about uh, integrated care systems and sustainability and transformation partnerships or STPs. These are the main ways that local areas should be bringing together uh, uh, NHS and other uh, partners to deliver the long-term plan. Uh, and she's, she's asking, what, what are the barriers and enablers to really getting mental health to have priority in those systems uh, and the range of partners, the right partners uh, at the table? My experience today of STPs, so, so there is some good experience, but generally the voice of housing and, and other sectors is not there. So and I think probably the voice of users as well isn't, isn't heard there. So if, if the idea is to co-design and improve that, then we have to look at how, this, uh, how the different sectors, how that system-wide approach is undertaken by STPs and so on. And Mark, what would good look like if, if STPs, these sustainability and transformation partnerships and integrated care systems were really engaging the full range of partners and service user groups that you'd like to see represented? Yeah, good would look for me, good would, what it would look like is, is involving um, people. Invo and when I say involving people, involving user groups, if you like, but the, the, the people who are service users themselves um, around the table, not just um, a tick box uh, mm -hmm. exercise that, you know, fine words are said about co-production, but it's not always equal partners in the, in the arrangement. And certainly I don't know of any STPs yet where that is done to any you know, good degree. Um, I'm more than willing to um, find out that I'm, I'm wrong and there are some that are doing it, but I haven't, we haven't heard of any yet as far as Ensign is concerned. So part of the culture change we're looking for is potentially not just around parity of esteem, but also this idea of co-production mm -hmm. and, and asking people to say what, what services they and, want and, and what equality, they should look like. Equal power. I mean, tra a transfer of power, basically, you know, to, to more equality um, you know, between partners. I'm sure this will come up through the discussion. Can I just add on Yes, that please well? do. I think, I think there's, there's absolutely an issue of talking to people. There's absolutely an issue of talking to the voluntary sector who, let's face it, are considered to be part of the solution mm -hmm. here. But actually for a lot of STPs and uh, ICSs, actually taking, bringing mental health around the table is going to be the first challenge because it, it, you know, the numbers and the history are, are dominated by the acute sector. So I think that is the first challenge. So that, that's interesting. The question I was uh, just about to ask you comes from Tom, and it's another big theme in the long-term plan about really focusing on prevention as well as treatment and services. Uh, and the question is, how do you view this in the context of mental health? But I'll maybe add to that, how realistic is it if we've actually got all this catching up ground to do that you've described of the historical uh, uh, deficit that needs correcting? Well, you could almost say because we've got so much catching up to do, prevention is, is going to be, you know, one of our big solutions even and more even more important and particularly working with children and young people. You know, we know the statistics, three quarters of mental health problems 
you know, starting before someone's 18, a half before they're 14, if we can really get the, the investment and the services right for children and people, that obviously that doesn't eliminate mental health mm -hmm. problems, but it, it sets us on a much better path. But you know, a lot of the other prevention work is done within local authorities and uh, within the voluntary sector, within schools, with mm -hmm. in, in other places where the funding isn't necessarily there and we haven't had a, a habit of being very holistic mm -hmm. in our approaches. So actually that is going to be something that people are going to have to start thinking differently about, I think. So it is a challenge. Rachel. Just, just around the funding position, it would have been welcomed if the settlement around social care could have come at the same time as the mm. plan and we're still waiting for that green paper and I think it would have helped actually that piece around prevention but also added to you know to that overall pot for mental health um, and we're still waiting for that and that I think makes it difficult because it then becomes it is just about clinicians and the NHS but to try and widen that out does require that additional investment for social care? I'd say it's not a totally bleak picture out there. There are some outstanding areas of good practice in preventative uh, services, particularly from peer, men peer mentoring and peer led um, perspectives, which is, you know, I think quite a cost effective way of, of, of you know, helping preventative services. But there's such a disparity between different areas and a postcode lottery almost. Um, and it would be good to see some leadership from, from the NHS around, you know, because I think almost SCPs are being left to reinvent their own wheel, um, apart from having a, a good steer uh, and, you know, the, the promotion of good practice across the board. Now, discussion of prevention led us into thinking about children and young people, because it's, it's obviously particularly important there. But we've got a question from Meg at Independent Age, who's also asking about have we got enough focus on older people? Have, are they really um, well, well catered for? Will the plan lead to the best support and care for older people? Rachel, I wonder if I could start with you on that. Do you have a, a sense of, of that balance? I, and I, I do come at this from being a provider of services. So we felt um, two years ago when we started looking at this work around mental health that we did not need to look at older people's mental health. We've been designing schemes that we call community wellbeing, and we've called it that on purpose because what we didn't want to create is more effectively more nursing homes or more services where they were just on the extra care model. So we're trying to, and we have a whole number actually in development over the next two to three years, where old, where they are one dementia friendly in the design allows people to live there. Um, whether or not they have dementia but it certainly allows couples particularly to uh, be with their partner and um, when that happens but also that we look at how we work from more of a reablement point of view and work with older people with mental health problems so they can interact with the community. I think historically in the housing world it's been about bringing everything into the scheme but we're very much more about reaching out and so if there are services around mental health or that whole prevention piece, we want to work with customers to go out and access that and support them. And it sounds like you're saying as well that if we're going to really meet the needs of older people, it's not just about the NHS, it's no, also about no, the partners no. in the local mm -hmm. area as well. It is, it is. Sophie, can I ask you, I'm afraid these are big questions that are coming in through our online audience. We've, we've got a number of questions uh, that are asking about the workforce. And are we actually going to be able to deliver this with the, the, the staff that we've got and the vacancies that we've got? Uh, we've had some challenges with the five-year forward view about having enough staff uh, and questions about whether the workforce implications were thought about earlier enough. Uh, what's your take on, on the situation with the workforce? How much of a risk is it? What can be done about it? It's a huge risk and obviously we can't, we can't possibly deliver with the workforce we've got now. And we definitely weren't fast enough with the five year forward view. You know, the, the commitments that were made to come to, uh, to, to come up with a plan on the workforce um, for the five year forward view, they, they weren't kept to the time and probably should have started even before the commitments were made. But, um, you know, there, there are some bright spots on the horizon. So I know that the um, Royal College of Psychiatrists initiative to recruit more psychiatrists, that's 
bearing fruit and you know actually if, if you look at it from the point of view of is this is mental health a good place to work it's a great place to work you know how what could be more exciting than working with people with mental health problems and helping them to recover and 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 seeing people's lives really change uh, but actually <laughs> You know, that's not the reality in a lot of services at the moment. They're still struggling and, and that makes them less good places to work. And so retention is an issue. But planning and thinking about these new roles and making sure that we've got peer support and that not we're not overly focused on the medical, um, that we're looking at the wider workforce and wider services. That it is a complex piece of work. And uh, yeah, it, it's going to be a challenge, I think. Thank you. Mark, I wonder if I could ask for your perspective on this. It keeps on coming back to thinking about the whole person, not just uh, necessarily the clinical roles, but the Absolutely. wider workforce as well. What, what do you see around the country? I, I know, well, around the country, I, I know that there's a, there's a massive paucity in, in the amount of GPs that we have, and that we're losing GPs, not recruiting enough. And if you know, the, the idea is to go from hospital care to community, um, as far as many people are concerned the community starts with their GP and that's that's going to be a difficulty but what I would say you know one one you know nice thing in the in in the future I would like to see is is the use of the massive untapped reserve of users themselves mm -hmm. um, you know people who've been through the system for quite a long time often want to get into helping other people um, now, some coordination of that would be brilliant, both for the people who are coming into the services, but also for the people themselves who are providing that, that care. And that doesn't always have to be voluntary either. It's not just about volunteers. It's actually about paying some people to do that. But it's not, you know, they're not going to be costing as much as a GP or a psychiatrist, for example. So, you know, there, there is a massive untapped reserve there. We talked earlier about uh, what can local sustainability and transformation partnerships do in practice to really get mental health on their agenda and, and, and good practice. Sounds like you're giving them some messages there about things to, to think about in their Absolutely, in their and, and, and it's there. The, the research is there. You know, they've only got to look, or, and if they, can't, if they can't find the time to look, we'll tell them. <laughs> Now, we mentioned some of the things that the long-term plan introduces for mental health around uh, extra funding, more community focus, uh, some, some access targets. One of the other areas that it prioritises is uh, psychological therapies or talking treatments. Uh, and it, it aims to Im increase access to these uh, in the general population and specifically in children and young people as well. There are, there are commitments. Uh, we've got a question though uh, about this from uh, online. Uh, so Sheen has asked us, are, are, is, is the approach to talking therapies a bit, a bit short term? Are we, are we missing out on the sort of longer term approach? Uh, and we've also got a question um, uh, about some of the approaches of face-to-face of, of, um, -face counselling for, for young people and what's the good practice there that we should be promoting. Uh, Mark, I wonder if I sh could come to you as well to start off on this. Uh, what, what are you hearing from your members about what they really want from, from talking treatments and, and is the focus on IAPT, the improving access to psychological therapies, which is quite short term, is that the approach that, that's um, right? It depends on the IAPT service because our members are telling us there are very different ways of providing IAPT services in themselves. In some areas, it's no more really than CBT. Um, cognitive behavioural therapy. Behavioural therapy. Um, and it can't it really, to, make, to, to have any value, it can't just be that. I certainly, I think what our members are telling us is they want to see a person. Mm -hmm. um, not, I, not just online. Not just online. And I, I know there's investment, that they're looking at investing into online things and it's all very well, but uh, there's no real um, substitute for actually talking face to face um, because just by the nature of human interactions, I think it's, that's, that's a far more benefit to the, ma the majority of people. Um, but as I say, the, 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 there is, there's, there's disparity again around, around the country around what, what an IAP service means. Sophie, is that, is that your view as well, that, that, that a key issue is about the variation between different areas and, and disparity? 
There's definitely a problem with the disparity and um, you know, IAPT is one of the areas where we've got really good data, well, relatively good data. And uh, you can see that everything, everything varies mm -hmm. um, from ac access to recovery rates and particularly recovery rates for um, people from black and ethnic minority communities, um, which aren't broadly aren't good across the country. So we know there's a lot more to do. IAP really works for a lot of people, so I don't want to say we don't want to be doing more of it, because clearly we do, you know, 50% of people and people who work for MIND or who I know have found it absolutely life-changing, including CBT or CBT, in fact. But, but it would be an absolute mistake if we just went, yep, we've, we've done the job on IAP, all we need to do is increase the numbers coming in because we do want to make sure that people get a choice because what about the other 50 percent you know they've had that experience of cbt and it hasn't worked for them to some extent that sets people back they begin to lose faith they, they sort of disengage and actually we need to find a way of building on iapt rather than just growing it and i think that's that's really important and it sounds like implicitly there's another another message there for, for sustainability and transformation partnerships, which is not just involving people in planning services, but actually in how they're working and how well they're yeah. meeting need over time. Yeah, and to make sure that, you know, we know that there's gaming in the statistics. We know that some people, you know, they, they're doing a group session or they're, they're you know, they're, a, they're not counting the people that are dropping out. or There are all sorts of things like that. And again, we want to make sure that this... this that the quality of the best um, services, where people are really given a speedy, effective um, service, is, is actually what becomes the norm. Thank you. Uh, now, Rachel, I've, I've got a question that you're going to love here. It's from Christina, oh and I love it because uh, we're getting really good short questions. So this one is absolutely <laughs> to the point, so I'm just going to read it verbatim. She said, what are the roles of housing in prevention? So looking across the broad, prevention agenda, what can housing contribute? How do we, how do we get that contribution? Um, in a number of ways actually. So one area in our mental health services, we have invested both centrally in, and in the schemes to have clinicians as part of our offer. And that was quite a brave step for us. It's not what most housing providers do and it did take investment to do it. And the link there with prevention is so we feel that we've got a better offer when people live with us and, and, and have care with us, that they are getting both that support side and housing advice side alongside the, the, the clinical input and not feeling that we're not looking after the whole person. And what we found is in our most recent schemes is their move on to a permanent home or, or somewhere that, where they're going to stay longer has been more successful and hopefully preventing admission because we've had such a good offer that's quite intensive at the beginning. And then I think the wider role of housing is that, you know, without stating the obvious, if you don't have a home, then your, your mental health is so far more likely to be impacted. We only have to look at what we see about people living on the streets and so on, how much that affects that. So I think housing's role is about alleviating some of that sharp edge stuff around people needing a home and a place of safety so that they can start to rebuild their lives. And housing associations have always been about that, but I think we've never been needed more than we are now to play that role. Thank you. Uh, I've got a question here from Greg, who's uh, in one of the academic health science networks. And uh, he's saying, you know, what we're talking about here to some extent is a culture change, which I think speaks to the things you were saying, Sophie, about catching up some of the historical attitudes towards mental health services and some of the things you were saying, Mark, about co-production, focusing on, on the person. It's a culture change, he says. So how are we going to change the current culture about the way that mental health is seen in the NHS, both by staff and patients? Uh, and he says top-down initiatives probably aren't the answer. They usually cause resistance. So, so how can we actually get staff to feel ownership of this agenda and really engaged in mental health? And I'll maybe start with you, Mark, if I will. What, what do you think can help with that culture change? I'd say involve, involve users in the training of, of staff to begin with, so that they, right from the early on they get a, a start with listening to people. Um, 
Yeah, I think it, it, you have to, it, to, to change people's culture, I think you have to get in there quite early. Um, and, and that's, that's one way of doing it, really. Practical suggestion that people can actually action uh, yeah. now, isn't it? Sophie, did you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to come at it from two different directions. I think there's something within mental health services and um, the work that MIND has done with Time to Change, which we run in partnership with Rethink Mental Illness, which is the anti-stigma campaign. Um, one of the things that we know is that um, stigma and discrimination within the general population has shifted quite markedly um, uh, and helped a lot by the work that Time to Change has done. But in, in the NHS and within mental health services, it hasn't. And um, we, we did some work with three mental health trusts and, and managed to make some traction there. But broadly, within um, the NHS, those attitudes haven't changed. And we know that it's about, it's about meeting people. Ch change comes in attitudes when people meet people on an equal basis, not when they meet patients who are not on an equal basis, but when they meet them on an equal basis and have a conversation, that just begins to change people's attitudes in a very natural sort of a way. And actually, we need initiatives like that with individuals, and, and that will begin to stop people being able to say, and I too have mental health problems as, as a manager or as a staff member. And that isn't very possible at the moment within, within trusts. And um, we know that when you have a combination of those two things, um, and, and managers being trained and knowing how to support their staff, actually, within organisations, uh, attitudes begin to change. So I'd say that within trust, but I, I actually think there is something about the top, um, the very top. So within the top of the NHS, interestingly, I think uh, you know, most of the senior jobs are taken by people who come from the acute sector. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we don't have people talking openly about their mental health from the top of that, although we do in other industries, interestingly, or, or in sport or music. Uh, so I think we need to see absolutely a change there and, and mental, and it becoming very difficult socially, you know, for all those people that mill around at the top, meeting each other every day, it becomes difficult socially not to be really aspirational about mental health. I think we've become I think low aspirations have become normalised, what Michael Gershon called the soft bigotry of low expectations. It's, it's pretty normal to think it's okay that mental health is way behind. And, you know, we're doing quite a lot because we're moving it, ooh, a couple of inches forward. And that seems to me, you know, to be sort of not, not acceptable. So, so let's continue with this theme because this feels like an area where as three non-NHS people, as three people from the third sector, you've got some insights and ability to stand back from NHS organisations and the systems like sustainability and transformation partnerships. So I think it's a really good way of getting your insight uh, into the cultural issues and what can be done about it. Rachel, what, what's your take on, on how we can get culture change happening? First of all, Time to Change is probably one of the best initiatives that has happened and we adopted that in home group, signed the pledge. The work that goes on with all different groups of colleagues across the business has been incredibly powerful and definitely enabled colleagues in, our, in, in home group to talk about their mental health. And then for our customers, people who are living in our mental health services, um, in, in, they, they too felt empowered, I guess, because they felt they were having a more equal conversation with their support worker and colleagues who they were working with. And we took that through actually into our apprenticeship program. So a lot of our customers who go through that then work for us. And a lot of those customers have come from our mental health schemes or have mental health issues that has allowed that to happen. So big, big fan of Time to Change and think we could see much more of that. And I, I personally haven't felt that I've seen so much of that in the NHS, NHS Trust that we've worked with. So um, a quite practical step that people could really sort of take is, now. It is, it <laughs> is. And definitely there is nothing more powerful than leaders talking about their own experiences. I was exactly um. going to ask that to follow <laughs> up because Sophie mentioned the importance of people in leadership roles. Can you say a little bit more about what you'd like to see in leaders of, of um, mental I, health services? I, I just think leaders need to be themselves and there's nothing more powerful than being a human leader, somebody who is willing to speak out about their own um, either mental health, but it's more than that, it's your passion for what, you're do, what you do, rather than feeling that, 
I suppose it's the distinction between management and leadership. So I think sometimes we feel we're there to just, you know, follow through on whatever plan it is and, and manage other colleagues rather than really strike out and lead and lead about what change you want to see. So, and I'm sure there are lots of people doing that in the NHS, but that's not necessarily what you, you see or feel when you interact with them. And I, my, I, you know, my interaction is, is around new services and how we are um, trying to alleviate the problems on wards and so on. But you, I don't feel that overall we see in the NHS that type of leadership that comes very much from, from the heart. And there's a bit of a theme in the discussion we've been having about openness and involving people in co-production as equals, uh, which, which um, I think goes some way to what you're saying. But I wonder if we can also think about that at national level. So I've got a question here from Romana who says, how much are, are MIND and other voluntary organisations, how much are you guys actually involved and able to contribute in policy and guidance for the long-term plan uh, at a national level? Uh, so that, so that the, the national direction is really sort of um, uh, uh, ensuring that patient care is delivered in a patient-centred approach in both community and inpatient uh, services. Maybe I'll start with you. Um, Sophie, because mine does have quite a big policy function, uh, how much are you able to influence that? How much do you want to be able to influence it? Well, we do talk to them a lot, and um, I mean, I, you'd have to ask them how much we've been able to influence <laughs> them. Um, I mean, I, and I do want to the say, door open, I guess. yes, the door is definitely open, and that is definitely uh, a different thing. So I remember when NHS England first started off, and it was I can't remember what it was called, but you know, the year before it started, we found it very difficult to talk to anybody there. Um, uh, but things have definitely changed and there's a group of people within NHS England who are working on the mental health side who are, who are completely passionate mm -hmm. and you know doing some fantastic work and you know around the country too there are some great people doing fantastic work but but it, that they are the my they are the minority and um, and they have an uphill task because we are so far behind and there's there's such a lot of other things that are going on within the NHS so um, I, I think we we do feel heard and we are able to take things we are able to raise concerns you know if we see things that aren't working or that the system is getting unbalanced we're able to we're definitely able to raise that yeah you'd have to ask them as to, oh, that's, that's <laughs> as to whether they whether they take any notice of us uh, that, that I think they mostly positive. do what, what about, Mark, what's your experience as, as a service user organisation mm -hmm. uh, with your members? Uh, yeah. how, how much are you, are you able to influence? What, what do you want to, to see happening? If, or or are, you, are you happy with the situation? Uh, we don't get a lot of uh, consultation as a, as a national organisation. And I know that as far as local groups also don't get a lot of consultation. We, we, we had a fair bit of input into the five-year forward view, less so for the long-term plan. We were uh, asked to um, give a submission. We were asked some questions and we responded. Um, that was the level of the commitment to, uh, to talk to us, I think. Um, not sure that we saw a lot of impact. I mean, we, we and some promotes a you know, in co-production, we promote what we call 4PI, which is about involvement standards, um, and we haven't we haven't really seen the impact that there's the I in the in the 4PI um, that that our, our you know views have have made. Um, but I I still hold out a brief that you know that that, that it's it's possible we'll, we'll get there. I mean, the, one of the difficulties, I think you, you're right, that the, you know, there are some people with a lot of passion. Unfortunately, that, I don't think that's, that's at, a, at a senior level, at a ministerial level. And we, do, we seem to have ministers that come and go, you know, almost uh, with every vote. Um, and I don't think that helps. So a bit further to go from your perspective. Um, I've got a great example, actually being able to influence it was on the learning disability agenda um, not necessarily on the mental health but we did second a colleague to NHS England to write housing options for their um, piece of work called building the right support which is all around the transforming care 
um, agenda and, and people with learning disability coming out of hospital and living in communities. So, and that came from our chief exec actually on sharing a platform with Simon Stevens, who was almost saying, we haven't got anyone to write the housing strategy piece. And we offered and, and seconded someone. So it does happen and, and actually, the piece of work is, you know, is of, of high quality and paid off um, because lots of organisations are able to use that to try and, and shift the transforming care programme. So, so we've got a number of examples here then. So that's one of, of rolling up your sleeves and doing yeah, the work with the national bodies. It, yeah. We've had participating in the national structures and, and groups. Uh, and, and I think your point is well made, Mark, about where are ministers in this? How, how are they listening to the voice that's coming up from the third sector? Now our questions are set by our audience, so uh, they'll dot around a little bit, but there's a couple of uh, ones that I wanted to cover off if we can because uh, they're quite big in the long-term plan. So one of them is about children and young people uh, and the, the next one will be about primary care networks. So can I ask about um, uh, children and young people and the specific question comes from uh, Rona at the Royal College of Physicians about how will the long-term plan help make sure we don't have a gap between uh, children and young people services and adult services. Uh, I wonder if I could start with you, uh, Mark, on, on this. What does the long-term plan say and, and, and is it the right thing? Well, there's, there's a fair bit around prevention and there are, and again, there are examples of good practice um, Around, around the country, you know, people getting into schools and, and you know, helping young people talk about mental health for a start off and recognise that it's there. That's one thing. The other thing that the long-term plan looks to do is to move the cliff edge of uh, services uh, from children and young peoples at 18 uh, further on um, and talking about, you know, to, towards 25. What the danger is for that, I think, is that we just move the cliff edge from 18 to 25. If we don't do work on that transition period um, so that it's a, it's a much, much smoother, because it's not a great experience for, for people, we know. What sort of things would you like to see to, to help manage that transition? <laughs> resources, really. Um, resources and services that recognise that transition, because people are transition in a, all sorts of different ways. I mean, they're, they're often transitioning around housing um, uh, as well as everything else. Education is obviously, uh, you know, transitioning. So there's a, there's a lot of things happening to, to, young, to young people at that time. Uh, and then, well, and, and for some of those, that, that's, that sparks off their, their, their problems with mental health. Um, it's recognising that and being able to, you know, do the preventative uh, things that uh, that can can help people deal with change. So, um, Rachel, if I could come to you next. So, so Mark's linked this very closely to thinking about prevention as well as the actual services for transition. And as he points out, housing is going to be one of the big issues around that time when people are, are, are just becoming independent uh, adults. It is, uh, uh, and we have a mix really. So we do have some services that are for younger people, six, 16 to 18. Um, we went with a big scheme recently in Gateshead that's a young people's mental health scheme. And the, the fear actually is with young people as well themselves. They know that the cliff edge is at 18 and that's quite difficult to manage when, mm -hmm. when you're living somewhere and you then worry that that might impact your home as well. It doesn't um, for home group because we've got a lot of property and we work with other providers too. We try and make that transition, but we do, and I haven't got the answer to this, but we do see that piece with them where the fear about that their, their service will stop at 18 from a clinical point of view. We've bolstered that by having clinicians in the service, but we can't fix it. All we can do is make sure that their home is secure and that they make the right move. Um, but I, d I think it's a, a, a massive issue that hopefully will be put right through the strategy, but I'm not totally sure it will. There's a, there's a history, isn't there, of mm. difficulty, but at least it's getting a bit more focus. Uh, is, is your uh, glass half full yes. uh, sort of view of it? <laughs> Can I ask about primary care networks? So primary care networks are 
groups of GP practices coming to work together and not just focusing on the GP but multidisciplinary teams of different professionals and then community nursing services and community mental health services, community therapy services will all be organised around these, these groupings of primary care services. So we've got a question from uh, Martin who's asked us uh, what's your view on primary care networks? I'm, I'm going to come to you first Sophie of, of how can we make sure this is effective? Are, are, they, are they the right way forward? Gosh well you know one structure or another structure um, it, it looks like a good structure compared to some of the other structures but you know we have had a lot of structures and it does seem to me that um, uh, we can obsess a little bit about the structures and what we really need to see is the, the cultures and the behaviours mm -hmm. and the collaboration and those are going to be the things that, that make this successful. You can definitely have a structure that stops people doing those things or facilitates but it's still going to be up to individuals to, to be working in different ways and for the primary care networks really to work in a holistic way so that a person is able to see their GP or have somebody come to their home or mm. um, you know get support when they're at their wellist and when they're at their illist and that links through to, to other services. That's going to be a lot of collaboration and um, quite a different way of working including for GPs. Um, and uh, the reality is, of course, in a lot of places, those services do still exist, despite the fact that, you know, f the voluntary sector has been um, starved and some services are closed. There is still a very rich pattern in most areas of different sorts of things, which at the moment people don't necessarily get access to because other people who they are in touch with don't know and don't refer. So if we can crack that, I think it could be revolutionary for people to be able to to, you know, to go to the doctor and talk about their mental health problem and then that person finds out that actually it's an issue of domestic violence or it's an issue of debt as well and to be able to be referred on so that those underlying issues are also being addressed because otherwise you know the next thing that happens is homelessness and then somebody drops out of primary care indeed because they've now got no fixed abode and you know all of those things will happen and actually if we can start to glue some of that together at very early point through the primary care no network actually that that could be extraordinary really it could be extraordinary but it will mean that people do have to work differently locally so so don't just focus on the structures it's how people work to meet yeah. individuals needs and some of that involves quite a big cultural change and practice change yeah. Mark, is that your view as well? What, how, what do you see the potential of this more community-focused uh, approach as? Again, it, it, it's, very, it's very focused on NHS and where the NHS is now. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's all led, um, even in the localities, around experts by medical qualification. Um, a little bit more of the experts by experience would be good. Mm -hmm. um, but also, don't stop uh, at um, yeah, the NHS services. Bring in the people from you know, drug and alcohol services. We haven't touched on, on dual diagnosis, for example. But you know, there, there's a whole thing to be done around that um, homelessness and all the rest of it. I, you know, there, there, are, there are many and, and varied ways of, uh, of involving people. Um, all, they, all they ask is for a seat around the table, really. Thank you. And Rachel, I wonder if you have a view on this. I'd only echo what, what both my colleagues have said, really. A, stru a structure won't fix anything unless you change behaviours. And also, I suppose the, the other piece is, actually, has that structure been consulted on with patients and service users who are going to use it? And what would their view be? And I'm sure nine times out of ten it would be, will I get the service that I want? I'm less interested in the structure. And that again is a theme through our discussion of partnership with people using the services to design and, and oversee them. Mm -hmm. There's a related question that's come up which again is one of the themes in our discussion about focusing on the whole person and really exploiting to the full what the voluntary and community sector can offer. Uh, and the question is about social prescribing. And uh, in the long-term plan, there's quite an emphasis on increasing social prescribing and a commitment to a thousand link workers to be based in GP practices to help make connections to non-clinical 
services in the community that people might uh, might access. Rachel, can I start with you? What's what's your thought on the potential benefit of, of social prescribing? Is it is it overhyped? Is it real? Uh, and, and does the plan actually set out a credible way forward? I love the idea of social prescribing. So we have a couple of schemes, actually, uh, where they were developed very simply by local GPs who wanted thought they wanted just housing advice and so tested um, whether we could deliver that and basically pay us to do some housing advice. And there, um, I guess, first view, was it, if, if, if you're in the room next door and I'm seeing a patient, I can then send them in to have that additional piece of advice, which was fine. And then it got much bigger because we started offering activities and diff other, other pieces that people were interested in. And so, and that's still going and working very well. I think the trick really behind it is having other coll colleagues from the third sector in the GP surgery available to do that and also co-located together yes and mm -hmm. and so they are but it's on a small scale I'd love to see that bigger and I think the whole idea of actually I quite like this that the prescription is written and then they go back to the, the GP and they look at what that activity or whatever um, we we offered and, and did is reviewed and is part of their whole prescription effectively so but do I think that's the <laughs> panacea for all of it no but it is an additional an additional piece that works very well and then and is is to a certain extent more user-led um, because s certainly some of the um, service users in our scheme dictated what they wanted to see on that prescription and then talked with the GP about it so it doesn't solve everything but but you're pretty keen no, yeah, and you've got yeah, some practical insight yeah. Yeah. And I think probably housing could do it because we certainly in specialist housing it isn't just about what's provided in the house. We do do, you know, trips and other uh, lots of activity and social stuff with the people who live with us. So that gave us access to do it. Mm. Can I ask the same question to, to Mark? What's, what's your insight into to, uh, the potential for social prescribing and, and does the plan say enough? Well, the potential is great. Um, and, I, you know, I can go back. You know, back to the days of PCTs, uh, whose you know, remit was to you know, basically do public health. And I think we've regressed a hell of a lot. And some of the social prescribing things used to be done in those days. I, I mean, for example, in, in the area that I live, uh, that there was a service where, where we had a walk from home, where people would go to somebody's house and you know, take them for a walk around their local park or something like that. That was paid by, by the PCT. And of course, when the PCT disappeared, you know, public health went to local authorities and CCGs. Yeah, that disappeared with it, and things like that have, have, have gone out gone out the the window really. And uh, yeah, social prescribing is great, but you know, who pays for it? But yeah, and it's an important point that that voluntary services are not free services. Yeah. They do still need to be funded. Yeah. Sophie, can I ask your, your your views on social prescribing? Yes, it's great. And a lot of our local minds around the country do it. And we've got a big scheme actually in Wales, um, specifically about social prescribing, because the government there is very keen on it. I don't think uh, it's, it's, I don't think it's easy. I mean, some of it's very easy. Um, but if you're going to do it really well for everybody, that mm -hmm. isn't easy. And uh, it doesn't mean that you can then just go, oh, all our mental health patients, we can just send them over there. You know, it's not that either. It's part of providing somebody with a really good service and recognising that their mental health isn't just a question of, um, of medication or talking treatments. It's about the issues going on in their lives and it's about social isolation. Uh, you know, it might be a gardening project. It might be some debt advice. It might be a whole range of things that people need and that might change over time as well. So it is about just spending a bit more time with people. So actually that will be, you know, something that the GP practice will have to take on, spending a bit more time with people to find out actually what to prescribe. Again, some good insights into how to make it work. Uh, we're heading towards the end of our time. So I'm going to end with one question that's come from Ella, which um, is possibly the most difficult of all. I'm sorry, so I'm going to ask you to answer it quickly. She's saying, 
which are the things in the long-term plan that need to be prioritised? So I'm going to ask you each, if there's one thing in the long-term plan that you really want to see happen and, and, and come to fruition, uh, what would it be? And I'm going to take you in order from Mark to Rachel to Sophie. Uh, and Mark, can you go first? One thing. The long-term plan talks about uh, removing the amount of difference there is between areas. And I raised it earlier on, but I'd, I'd see that as the most important thing the, 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 the postcode lottery, the disparity of service across, across uh, the country. Thank you. Rachel, what's one thing that you would really like to emphasise for the long-term plan to deliver on? I'm going to say it, even though people will expect me to say it, is the joined up piece. I think being able to see what's happening about social care and allowing housing to play a more key role in the response to the plan is, is what I think should happen. I think both of those were omissions that shouldn't have been made. I think you might have snuck in more than one thing there. Yeah, but well, I tied it into one. <laughs> Thank you. Sophie? Well, thanks, Ella. That's a horrible question. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I'm going to go with children and young people because I think that was the area that was probably most behind and it's probably the area where you can make most difference if we can really get a good service there. It's terrible how we treat our young people. Mm. And, and the benefit we, we both for children benefit. young people today and future adult generations. Yes. The children of future adults, it's true. And if we can make a difference there, yeah, we make a difference long term. So it's been fantastic getting your insights into a plan that has a, a large number of commitments and, and how they fit together is complex. We've got more questions than we can possibly answer, unfortunately. Uh, we will be uh, putting these questions to all of you so you can see what people are asking. Uh, we will do our best to cover them as, as, as we can over the coming weeks and months. Uh, thank you for all the questions that have, that have come in today to, to, to this session. So I just want to thank our three panel members again uh, for being willing to share your insights. The particular uh, value that you're bringing of, of third sector insights uh, is really important in this debate. Uh, and it just uh, remains for me to say thank you and to our online viewers, thank you for logging in. Uh, please share the link uh, of the, the web page for other people so that they can register and view this session. Uh, and thank you, goodbye. Thank you.